Hi, everybody. Welcome back for another edition of The Biz, the Business Integrity School. And in this episode, we have with us Dr. Margaret Heffernan. Hi, Margaret. How are you today? I'm very well, Cindy. Very happy to be talking to you. Good. Me too. I'm happy to be talking with you. So Margaret has produced programs for the BBC for over 13 years, and she then moved over to the U.S. She's actually in London right now, where she spearheaded multimedia productions for Intuit, The Learning Company, and Standard & Poor's. She was chief executive of three different companies, Information Corporation, Zinezone Corporation, and then ICAST. She was named one of the top 25 by Streaming Media Magazine and one of the top 100 media executives by The Hollywood Reporter. What I also like is that Margaret is the author of six books. Her third book, which I really enjoyed, was Willful Blindness, Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Peril. We're going to talk about that one a bit more in our podcast today. And it was named one of the most important business books of the decade by Financial Times. Her TED Talks, which if you haven't watched them, I would encourage you to. They're wonderful. They've been seen by over 12 million people. Her most recent book, Uncharted, How to Map the Future, was published in 2020, and there is a particularly relevant chapter in there that we're also going to get into today. Right now, Margaret's a professor of practice at the University of Bath, where she lectures on management and practice and organizations. She's also the lead fac faculty for the Forward Institute's Responsible Leadership Program. And through American companies, she mentors CEOs and senior executives of major global organizations. Margaret holds an honorary doctorate from the University of Bath, and she continues to write for the Financial Times and the Huffington Post. Margaret, welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> So let's jump in to you a little bit and help our audience just uh, understand how did you go from being a CEO of three different companies to teaching? Well, um, it's interesting. When I was still actually running tech companies in Boston, I did a certain amount of teaching there in entrepreneurship, uh, which I really enjoyed. And then I started doing a little bit of teaching when I moved back here to the UK. And chiefly what I loved about it was I just loved being in touch with young people and getting a sense of what did the world look like to them and what did it look like to me and you know how could we compare notes. And so that's really how I got into it. And um, the professor of practice, as you're probably aware, is a relatively new thing in the academic world in the sense that I'm not an ac academic by background or training, or I have to say inclination, um, but it's a recognition, and I think a very smart recognition in business schools and schools of management, that it's really helpful to have a few people around who've actually done the business um, and not studied it merely, not merely, but not studied it only in abstract, but actually in reality. Yes. And, um, and so, you know, I write about obviously my own experiences, but I spent a lot of my time working with leaders of organizations around the world. And I'm very interested in the real lived experience of mm -hmm. doing business mm -hmm. rather than any particular theory. So when this role was offered to me, I was pretty excited because it's not a full-time role, so I can do all the other things I do. But I just love spending time with young people and. And I think, to be honest, they like the fact that I have a somewhat different style from a more yeah. trained um, educators. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I think business schools in particular are most open to that sort of professor yeah. of practice. And it creates this really nice bridge, I think, yeah, for the I students agree. to go from this academic world, which for many of them is all they've ever known, mm -hmm. to start to get a little bit of an insight into what's it really going to be like on yeah. the other side, and then marrying those two together. I think yeah. it equips them to be able to handle that um, more readily and probably have less of a, you know, come up to speed time when they start. So Margaret, you have a motto and your motto uh, is let's not play the game. Let's change it. Mm. I love that. But I want to know how did you come up with that and why? Well, I think that emerged when I wrote my first book, which is called The Naked Truth, which was really about women's um, careers, especially women's uh, corporate careers. Mm -hmm. And I felt that an awful lot of um, training, a lot of writing, a lot of business school education was to teach you how to play the game. And I felt pretty strongly, and I feel just as strongly now, that the game was designed by men for men. 
in a different era. And I didn't particularly think it would be a triumph to get very good at somebody else's game. Mm -hmm. So the whole point of life, in fact, is to figure out what is your own game? Who are you? How do you want to do this? How do you want to bring your experience and your knowledge and your values to work? Yeah. And that just imitating men was really not a terribly exciting prospect, even if it was potentially a very rewarding prospect. Yeah. And I think since then, you know, I think that that has deepened in the sense that I feel there is much that is badly, badly wrong about the right way that we run organizations and about the impact that those organizations have on the world and that there is probably more to change than to preserve. So the, I, you know, thinking about, so what are the bits that need to change? Mm -hmm. How do we go about that? You know, it was absolutely central to everything I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in 2018, there was um, an interesting statistic that of the 2,500 largest companies in the world, um, forced CEO turnover, the number one reason for forced CEO turnover was unethical behavior. Mm. And that trend continued largely into 2019. Mm. Um, and we all know that we still have primarily men that are at the very top of the right. largest corporations as CEOs. So um, I think we also all know what was happening at around that time, you know, 2018, yeah. you know, there was the Me Too movement and everything else. So an obvious question would be for you, if more women were playing their game um, and not trying to fit into um, a man's world per mm -hmm. se, and if more women had been at the top, do you think we would have seen the same, the yeah. same type of statistics? And if not, why not? Yeah, so this is sort of the question about, you know, if it had been Lehman Sisters, would we have had the financial crisis? Um, I don't think it would make any difference, to be honest. I am really? extremely uncomfortable with the, women, with the idea that women are uniquely ethical and we're these sort of angelic, uh, superhuman people who aren't subject to temptations and corruption like everybody else. I think fundamentally, in where you see unethical behavior, um, what you see is an abuse of power. Right. And the problem is about power. And I think if you give exceptional amounts of power to women, you will find as much corruption as you will see with men. And as it happens um, right now, there are fewer women with that power. And the women that have the power are so intensely scrutinized that if they have so much as a broken fingernail, you know, they're hung out to dry. But I think if we really were on a level playing field and you saw just as many men and uh, just as many women with just as much power and the same degree of scrutiny, I don't see any particular reason to think that, that women would come out better. I think power is a very dangerous thing. In the time that I ran companies, I felt that it was something I ought to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. I think it's a problem, not, not a privilege, if you like. Um, I think it's exceptionally difficult for it not to go to people's heads and for people not to think that the fact that they have this power is because they're special. Right. And being special, the rules don't really apply to them. Right. And, and of course, very often when you have a lot of power, you're surrounded, whether you want this or not, <clears throat> you're surrounded by people who, for lack of a more elegant term, I will say, suck up to you. You know, one of the, the premises of willful blindness was a sense that when we saw a lot of corruption, particularly around the time of the financial crisis, starting with Enron, I didn't really buy uh, George Bush's argument that this was uh, just a few bad apples. Uh -huh. I thought it's much, much more systemic than that. Yes. And while I, I definitely accept there are bad guys out there, right? And there are bad women out there. Sure, right. Right. Um, I think the more profound issue is how do we run organizations so that power isn't as much of a problem mm -hmm. and so that it isn't as corrupting as it demonstrably is. 
Yeah. Yeah. I am so glad you made the point though, that you did about um, whether or not it would be the same between men and women, because I do think there are a lot of people that are, that are trying to draw that conclusion, yeah. if you will. And honestly, I think it's looking at it the wrong way. It's just, we only have men as the example, simply by virtue of the fact that men are at the top of these organizations. That doesn't mean it would necessarily be different. And to your point, yeah. Willful blindness is a great segue into the larger question of power. And, and that book is all about why do we ignore the obvious mm. at our peril? Yeah. And so I'm just going to ask you that question flat mm. out. Why do you think that people in positions of mm. power and otherwise within organizations mm. will ignore the obvious? Well, I mean, there are many, many reasons. Um, one is because they are typically not universally, but typically surrounded by people like themselves who like them. So they're surrounded by cheerleaders, um, which means that that's a very helpful filtering system to keep the bad news and the early warning signs out. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, many of these individuals work insane, insane hours with an insane workload. And you know, one of the most basic causes of willful blindness is fatigue and co cognitive overload, right? So the more tired you are, the less productive you become, but also the more tired you are, the more your brain starts making shortcuts. And of course, the stuff that you miss out is often the stuff that gets you into deep trouble. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we know that, um, you know, in order to absorb the huge amounts of information, which we have to absorb to get through our daily lives, regardless yeah. of our position in, in an organization, our brain develops mental models of how the world works. And these are very, very useful because otherwise, if we had to figure out everything from first principles every day, you know, it would take a day's work to get out of bed. <laughs> um, so, so we have these mental models, you know, just like economists have economic models, just like physicians have models of disease and so on. And they're intensely useful because they do mean we don't have to invent everything from scratch. But there's a problem with the efficiency that they give us which is that they achieve that efficiency by paying lots of attention to what confirms the model and marginalizing, trivializing, editing out whatever doesn't fit into the model. Mm. So, um, you know, the, one of the classic examples of this is Alan Greenspan, who was absolutely convinced his mental model said that the healthiest financial markets are those with the least amount of regulation. And so although there were routine breakdowns in the um, derivatives market, virtually on the clock every two years from 1998 to 08, he steadfastly refused to see that this was a problem that required any kind of regulatory oversight. And subsequently, you know, in his, um, in his testimony to Congress, he said as much when he said, you know, he admitted that he had what he called an ideology, which I would call a model. And he said it had a flaw in it. But because it had served him so well to date, he didn't really pay attention to these early warning signs, which he could see, sadly, for all of us, only in retrospect. Mm -hmm. In addition, there's a huge amount about organizational um, structures and culture which amplifies our blindness. So there's something known as organizational uh, silence, which shows that if you ask a group of executives, do you have issues and concerns at work that you don't voice, up to 85% of them will say yes. And when you ask why, it's typically because they're afraid of initiating a conflict that they don't know how to manage. Yeah, that now, is an amazing statistic. It's a heart-stopping statistic. And, you know, when I first read that, I thought that, I mean, it captures something which I know from experience is true, which is the hardest thing in a responsible position is knowing what the heck is going on. <laughs> because people will tell you what you want to hear and they won't tell you what you don't want to hear and you can't be everywhere. In addition, we know that human beings 
generally speaking, are, are um, obedient, which is if you tell somebody to do something, even if it's mad, bad, and stupid, there's a high likelihood that they will. And we saw this, for example, in the Wells Fargo scandal, where people were told to sell eight products to every customer, something that has never been done in financial services. Right. And everybody knew the target was impossible. Right. But, you know, what they did kind of creatively is they thought, well, if we can't hit it the right way, we've got to hit it. So let's do it the wrong way. So they just started selling products to people without the customers being told what they were signed, what they were being signed up for. Right. Right. I think this whole, it's a lot that we do in the way of managing people with kind of slicing and dicing work, which means a lot of the meaning of the work kind of falls in the gaps between. Yes. Yes. And the meaning is the glue that gives people the purpose to get up and want to go do their piece of the yeah. work every day. But if someone tells you just fix this piece, right. You don't know what this piece does. Uh -huh. You don't know whether you're doing a safe thing or a dangerous thing. Yeah. So the yeah, division of true. labor is a really big piece of this problem, I think. Yes. And I also think somewhat controversially that money is a problem too, which is we know from a huge range of sometimes comic ex experiments that money really reorients people's thinking from others to themselves. And I think, you know, all of these problems coexist. It's not like, oh, it's just one thing or another. They all kind of knit together to the point that, you know, at point, there were times when I was writing Willful Blindness, I was kind of amazed we ever got anything intelligent done. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you, did you find at all that it was cultural that this, these, these problems and issues we're talking about in the 85% existed in, let's say, in the U.S. as opposed to in other parts of the world? Or what did you find out about that? Well, it's interesting because I've, I've been all over the world talking about this work. And, um, you know, in Singapore, they said willful blindness is very bad here because people care a lot about saving face. Mm -hmm. And um, in the Netherlands, they said, oh, it's particularly bad here because we don't like having arguments. And in Eastern Europe, they said, well, it's really bad here because of years of um, Soviet rule just taught us to just do as we're told and button up. Right. And in England, they say, oh, it's really bad here because, you know, we're so polite. And in America, they said, oh, it's really bad here because we're so conformist. <laughs> and so, you know, I have come to the conclusion it's bad everywhere. You know, yeah. I haven't found a single place where people say to me, we nothing like that ever happens here. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I would love to find it, but I haven't found it. Yeah. So, do you have any tips after these years of research for that you can share with with individuals for how they can be aware of this tendency toward willful yeah. blindness, um, but then counteract the effects of it? Yeah. So, I mean, some of it's really simple. Um, you know, which is get a good night's sleep. Yeah. Uh, don't multitask. Absolutely do not multitask. You know, it's a disaster. Um, find allies, colleagues, and friends who are not like you. Um, seek them out. You will not find them naturally because it's not the way our brains are designed. So, you know, when you find yourself moving to talk to that person who looks a bit like you, stop and go somewhere else and talk to somebody who looks a completely different from you. And this will take more effort, but it'll also be a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. I think as a manager, I think it's really important to appreciate that on the whole, people are not going to tell you what's going on. Yeah. So you have to think about, do I have an information network of people in different positions that are, who trust me and whom I trust who will tell me? I mean, I always, in my companies, tended to have people who'd worked for me in previous companies, mm -hmm. and they knew that they could come to me with everything. Right. Um, and the fact that they did that kind of taught the others that they could too, eventually. Yeah, yeah. I think exactly. it's very important for leaders to model argument and conflict at work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that people can see that it's safe. 
So that brings us to your most recent book that I want to talk to you about a little bit and have you share with the audience. And, and there's really two points in it that I'm hoping we can get at. Um, so your latest book is Uncharted, How to Navigate the Future, which is so important right now in these times that we're living in because mm-hmm. it's a very disruptive world and it's very right. unclear. Right. And um, there are two parts of it that I want to dive into with you. And the first one has to do with technology. Mm-hmm. And um, and you've even led tech companies, as you've mentioned here. And what what I think was interesting about the book is you talk about the human factors and skills that are still really needed, different ones than before. Mm -hmm. So not so much about efficiency and predicting, but more about being able to come up with, um, as you talk at preparedness, Mm -hmm. and then some other values um, and skills and competencies that are important. Um, So one, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about what you think those skills are, but then two, Mm -hmm knowing that technology is so prevalent in our world today, how do we hold those two in balance, the human competencies that you think we need with the technology that's really trying to take over for those human competencies in many respects? Well, so I'll probably answer that question backwards. So I'll answer a second bit fit first. Um, I think technology is fantastic at things that are repetitive, predictable, um, that essentially allow us to outsource a huge amount of grind. Mm. Um, you know, I've outsourced to my phone knowing all my kids' phone numbers, right? I mean, I used to know all of my family's phone numbers by heart. I don't anymore because technology takes care of it for me. That's great. Um, so I think it's very useful for that sort of work. I think it's very dangerous to outsource human judgment uh, to technology for two reasons. One is because when I outsource to an algorithm, I'm outsourcing to a whole bunch of opinions. An algorithm is just a bunch of opinions encoded in numbers. I'm outsourcing to a bunch of opinions. Opinions I don't know, which are typically protected as trade secrets, but whose decision I can't explain. Right. So if as many people have done, you try to outsource, you know, um, who is going to get parole or who is entitled to certain kinds of social security benefits. Um, I want to be sure that every base has been covered in terms of making sure this is a safe decision. And I want to be able to explain it because if it goes wrong, you can be sure I'm going to have to explain it. Right. Oh, the computer said yes. It's not a legitimate explanation. No, never will be. Mm -mm. And, um, and compute, you know, software is not good at the why. It's not good at causality. It's very good at correlation, but it's poor at causality. And often, you know, even the engineers who design these systems can't explain the decisions that they make. (laughs) So this is a kind of spectacular form of willful blindness, really, which is saying I'm going to get a system I don't understand to make a decision that I can't explain. Right. Right. That's kind of the ultimate in willful blindness. I think there's another issue here, too which is, you know, when you outsource a task to technology, as we were discussing earlier, um, you lose the ability to do what you've outsourced. Uh So, you know, I've lost the ability to know my kids' phone numbers. Um, You know, the the more I use GPS, literally, the smaller the part of my brain responsible for visual cognition becomes. Right. I'm not exercising that part of the brain so it doesn't need to be as big. Right. The more I don't have to be polite to people because I can shout at Alexa what I want, the less polite my manner is. And we see this with kids, you know, who are used to shouting at Alexa whatever it is they want. Right. Um, And we've also seen it, for example, using tablets uh, to collect electronic records in hospitals, which is we found that doctors were spending more time looking at the tablet than looking at the patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a cost to this always. And if you can't see it, look deeper. Yeah. But you have to think about what skills am I happy to lose? 
Yeah. And the repetitive bureaucratic ones that to, to make, give All you more it. time for judgment is, yeah. is kind of the balance. That's great. Yeah. So one other thing I want to ask you about, there was a chapter in the book um, that was all about uh, uh, the creation of, um, talking about preparedness. So it was the creation of the, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, that was founded in 2017 hmm. um, to be a global insurance policy, hopefully, to defend against future epidemics. I highly doubt you had any idea that we were on the verge of another global pandemic at the time you were writing that chapter. So this is an incredible moment, I think, to just be able to hear from you about what you think uh, about that chapter in this moment yeah. when we are in the middle of a, of a global pandemic. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the, really the spur to writing the book as a whole was a recognition that we had a very, very poor understanding of how to think about the future. So we were tending to do forecasts um, that we invested with insane degrees of confidence. Uh, when forecasting really at its best is accurate, probably maybe maximally 400 days out. And if you're talking weather forecasts, you know, it's 500, sorry, it's five days out. Mm. Bearing in mind that weather forecasts are the pinnacle of forecasting knowledge. And yet we seem to spend all of our time saying what's going to happen, what's going to happen. And um, so that's, you know, that was the spur to the book as a whole. And when I found out about the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, I was, you know, overjoyed because I thought somebody else is thinking about this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what they, so they set the, the coalition up in 2017. It was started by the Wellcome Trust, which is the biggest funder of medical uh, research in the world. Uh -huh. but largely because they recognized that governments had stopped doing epidemic planning. Uh -huh. And they were alarmed by this. Uh -huh. And they said, this is dangerous because we, you know, we know epidemics were always with us. Right. We know they will all keep occurring. But yes. there's no profile of an epidemic. Every single one is different. Different. Mm -hmm. So we don't know when the next one will be. We don't know where it will break out. And we can't predict the pathogen. So we have to think about this differently. Mm -hmm. And the way they chose to think about it was to ask a fantastic question, which is, when an epidemic breaks out, what will we wish we had been doing now? Uh -huh. Yes, and exactly. Ask the question. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, all of the epidemiologists who started working this question said, well, actually, if an epidemic breaks out, what you want, you want to walk into it with the following things intact. You want a vaccine that works. You want deep connections, affiliations, trust, with local, national, and global uh, healthcare providers and systems. You want access to capital because you know you're gonna to have to have, spend a lot of money very fast. And you want um, manufacturing and distribution contracts in place because you're going to have to make and distribute vaccine at speed. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they were set up to do, to put all of that in place. And what then right. the way they started was to start with the top six diseases that they thought had pandemic potential and where the impact would be gravest. And, um, and they started developing, working on those vaccines, aware that vaccine production act generally takes about 10 years. The fastest we've ever done it is four years. Right. And recognizing that many, many vaccine candidates fail. So right. this is very efficient, which is why governments didn't want to do it, right? Because some of the vaccines won't work and some right. of them you may never need. Right. I mean, they started working on a vaccine for Nipah. Well, there may or may not be a Nipah pandemic. One. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and of course, you know, the only sadness is really that instead of starting it in 2017, it would have been great if they'd started in 2007, right? Yes, right. But, um, but I, what I really liked about um, the people at CEPI was that they had this fantastic framework for addressing uncertainty. Mm -hmm. so there's uncertainty, for example, in climate change. We know it's real but we don't know which forests are going to catch on fire, which agricultural crops are going to be drowned this year. 
But what we can do is start asking these questions, which is if these things happen or when these things happen, what do we need to have in place to cope with them? And that's almost the definition of a robust system. Mm -hmm. It's different from resilience in the sense that it's not about recovery. Right. It's actually, we can cope with it when it happens. Uh huh. And, um, and I think that we have not done that kind of preparedness thinking in business and management generally because yeah. it looks inefficient. Why waste your time? It may never happen. Mm -hmm. Well, so you're not going to do preparedness thinking for everything. Right. But the things that are likely that would have a huge impact, I think now we've learned the lesson the hard way. We yes. have to do those things. And yeah. not to do them means we're willfully blind. So on that brings me right to my last question. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing what you know with this wonderful body of knowledge and the uncertainty of the future, what do you think are the three words that would describe what's going to be most important for business ethics and integrity as we move mm. into this uncertain future? Mm. I think it's certainly going to be the ability to conduct argument well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're both big fans of the giving voice to values curriculum. Yes. I think it's a brilliant way of teaching people Agreed. how to have the arguments around the things that we need to have the arguments around. Yes. And teaching people not just how to articulate their concerns, but also teaching leaders and managers how to listen, listen. and how to hear really what's being said. Right. That's absolutely fundamental. Yes. I think, um, you know, one of the conclusions I came to in willful blindness was that I didn't think you could ever eliminate it, but that certain kinds of organizations were more susceptible to it. And those were organizations where there was a steeper hierarchy, mm -hmm. where there was more bureaucracy, and there was a culture of competitiveness, that all of those things make an organization more susceptible to willful blindness. So to the degree that you can lower the hierarchy, eliminate as much bureaucracy as humanly possible, um, I think you have a safer environment. It's right. never going to be 100% safe, right, right. but it's going to be safer. And I think to the degree that you have a collaborative rather than a competitive right. culture, competitive. Yeah. people are less likely to hide yes. information from you. Yeah. And the third thing I would say, which, you know, again, goes right back to basics, is that actually, if you're too tired to think, you're going to miss things. You are. And, you know, many, many executives are. I mean, they're upright and they look like they're thinking. But, you know, we've known since 1888 that productivity taps out at about 40, 45 hours a week. You know, most senior leaders I know work much longer than that. And right now, after the huge amount of extra work required by responding to the pandemic, every single person I know is absolutely exhausted. Right. And what we know from all the brain science is that when you are so tired, you cannot think. And we also know that ethical thinking is cognitively very expensive. Yes. So you have to think about what engineers call asset integrity, which is you want the machinery with which you do your most important work, which in our cases is our brains, right. to be kept in tip top condition. Yep. That means getting a good night's sleep, getting a decent amount of exercise, and being able to step away from the daily grind mm -hmm. to have thinking time. Mm -hmm. Those are great, great thoughts. Margaret, this time together with you has been enriching and so enjoyable. And I want to end with one last question just for fun that I always ask everybody. So a lot of us are exhausted and we also have some extra time on our hands because of COVID. Yeah. So folks are watching more shows or Netflix, you know, documentaries yeah. or, or episodes and, and, and series of mm. things or reading fun books or podcasts, mm. finding new things, new right. outlets. Do you have any good recommendations that are sort of fun, but also have um, 
a, a bit of an ethical dilemma embedded in them because I find so many of the mainstream shows and, and books and podcasts too. But what have you been reading or watching or listening to that you'd recommend kind of for fun? Two radically different things. <laughs> <laughs> so I caught up on uh, a, a series which was on Netflix, which is a US TV series, which is called Pose, which oh. is about uh, the transgender community in New York in the 1980s. Okay. It was, some, it was just, uh, my daughter put me onto it. It was a story I did not know at all. Yeah, I don't it's either. It's incredibly uplifting. It's incredibly moving. It taught me a great deal about transgender issues and the transgender community, which I'm ashamed I didn't know before and I'm glad I do now. But it's, it's full of fantastic human beings. And it is really uplifting and um, utterly captivating. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is the, probably the best book I've read recently is a book called Learning from the Germans. Uh -huh. which is about how the Germans came to terms with their Nazi history. And it's written by an American philosopher. It's in two halves. The first half is about um, the German experience. And the second half is about the American experience of slavery. And it is deeply provocative, very moving, unbelievably thought provoking. And one of the most wise things I have ever read about our need as Americans to think much more deeply about our past if it isn't going to undermine everything we stand for. Oh, that is great. I'm going to add both of those to my list and I know many in the audience will too and we'll put links to them in the in the show notes. Right. Margaret, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, this well. has been just a delightful time to spend with you and I appreciate it very much. Well, thank you for your wonderful work and your wonderful questions and your wonderful spirit and, and your optimism because, you know, I think like me, you're an optimist. And if we don't believe we can get there, then we That's never right. will. That's right. Have to believe. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you, Cindy. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.